I've been training myself for, I guess one could say like my whole life, but kind of in an adult way for the past 10 years or so. And I started off with a really vague goal of just like wanting to look better and feel better and also to do something with my time to fill up, yeah, to fill up my days because I was an artist and I had a lot of free time and I just didn't know what to do with myself. So for me, like then to keep interested in that, I realized that I needed to make progress and to keep going forward. But also I kind of intuitively sensed that it was arbitrary, the things that I was working on. So in a way, like for me, performance is a way to get around the kind of arbitrariness of like optimization or just progress because performance encompasses a lot of things. Like performance is also for me kind of like sitting well or you know, holding myself well or being able to do like a wide variety of activities and not just being able to say like, okay, I'm gonna increase this particular exercise like over time, which at some point leads to a place of like either diminishing returns or just a tremendous increase in like the risk slash load required to make progress. So for me, performance kind of, yeah, it gets around that by just giving me something to go for in a general way. Totally. So in that sense, does it give you some sense of uh, reason or like, I don't know, I think often with uh, different practices, you maybe reach a certain point where it's this liminal space of like, um, why am I doing this? I keep, you know, I'm getting better or whatever, but what am I doing this for? Does, does that in any way speak to this sense of performance? I think as far as the why of it goes, it's definitely the, the process. And like if I can stay interested in like the ideas behind a little bit of theory, but also then like expose myself to new forms of challenges and stuff like that, that's a reason to keep going with it. In a way, like that's kind of like the hardest part of training as an adult who doesn't have like a sport to work on. Um, when you're a kid and you're like playing soccer, you have to play soccer and your parents make you do it and you want to be the best at it. But as an adult, you don't have to do anything. And so to stay interested in it, yeah, I mean, I, get, I don't know. In this sense too, I mean, beyond the why level of kind of value, would you see any similarities between this idea of progress uh, in relation to te technological discourse or any sort of like the way people talk about performance and technology enhancement, these sorts of things? That's interesting um, because I'm in the process of making kind of like an equipment company for sports stuff. And we really want to get away from the idea of the body as a machine because that's something that's obviously been a huge part of the 20th century fitness dialogue, especially with like training machines and also though with like the advent of like digital monitoring technology and also just like more and more accurate clocks and stuff like that. You have this strong dialogue that says the body is a machine and you can improve it like a machine. You put this fuel in, you get that result out. You do this exercise, you get that skill out. It's true to a certain extent, but again, it comes down to like how how you want to live your life and how, how much you want to make sports as like a kind of boxed in idea, like the main point of these activities. And if you want to just live well and feel good, then maybe like those kind of mechanical analogies are like a little bit brutal. And they kind of like close you off to a lot of other places where like actually sports maybe isn't so effective. Um, something I'm interested in a lot lately is this Alexander technique which is like um, an idea, it's like a movement training thing, which comes from a guy who was like speaking and he was getting hoarse in his throat, so he rearranged his head and his life got better. And that is something that you do all the time. And they'd give you these trainings where they just have you sit up and stand and walk around and ask you questions and pilot your head. And everything about movement is becoming more and more effortless and you use less energy and it's easier. And that, in contrast to like training, which is happening maybe like five hours a week, tops if you train a lot, that'd be like quite a bit. Most people are probably training like three hours, two hours a week out of the other 130 hours or whatever it is per week. There's something missing there with like, oh, I sit all the time like this, so I'm gonna do an exercise that's gonna open me up like that. And that will work to a certain extent, but it also falls really flat on its face. And I think that there are gray zones there around like this kind of open-mindedness to like general things. Yeah, that's kind of interesting in relationship to like this idea of plasticity, you know? Like what you're able to actually um, maintain, like what sort of changes in performance and in your body and technique. I mean, it's, Alexander technique is particularly like kind of frustrating in a way because you have a lesson and you go away from it and you feel really good and then you, it like decays. So you do have to kind of like keep touching base with it. I don't know if there's a point where it's in, 
it's in me and I don't have to think about it anymore, but like, because also there's all these kind of frustrating things where it's like not about thinking more about it or it's not about trying harder to do it well. It's about always about doing less and like making it easier. So when you're like, I'm gonna stand up straight and you pull your shoulders back, like you've added problem on top of problem and it's not gonna work, which is, I guess it's a lifetime thing. It really speaks to this interesting dynamic between um, maybe techniques and the body in the sense that like there's these different cultural practices and different ways of thinking about it that maybe in some ways this speaks to this idea of anthropotechnics in the sense um, where yeah is there it breaks down that separation of body and mind that you were speaking of and I wonder in that sense like how you understand culture and tradition in that sense of the way those are literally embodied through these different rituals and techniques and processes. I mean in terms of like culture, I think about clothing a lot and I think about furniture a lot, which are, I guess, elements of culture, right? And I, um, I think a lot about how those things are set up in ways that I, I don't know if it's fair to say, but I don't necessarily approve of. Like people wearing uncomfortable clothes that they can't move in. Although I have to say that like we've been trending actually towards comfy clothes. Even furniture, I really wonder like how useful furniture is. Like here I'm sitting in a chair with a back it would probably be better if I was just like sitting in a stool. And at home, for example, I don't have furniture at all. I just have like stuff on the floor. Like I, I sleep on the floor, I eat on the floor, like I don't have any chairs and stuff like that. And I really feel that that is good for me. And I don't know exactly if, how that means culturally, but I would like to see then, I don't know, people being more aware of like the limits of the things that they impose on themselves in terms of like wearing jeans and like sitting all the time and not being able to get on the floor. Like I have a friend who visited me some months ago and he came into my place and he had a moment where he was like, I, and he, bl he blanked, he couldn't get on the floor. You know what I mean? He took him like a while like to like lower himself down and his pants were way too tight and he couldn't get, he, you know, it was painful for him. Yeah, for right now I just think that culture has some The general culture and how it relates to the body is still kind of coming out of this like anti-body Christianity phase and we're like still moving into some kind of other phase where like movement is not gross and also where the body is not a thing only for a worker and also kind of like, yeah, like making it classy again to be like in touch with your physicality, which I think for a long time, like, I mean, the Victorian gentleman is like super skinny, you know what I mean? He doesn't do stuff. Like the woman is super pale. She has like assistants and maids, you know, people have clothes that make it literally hard to move and that's like elegant, you know, like Japanese people in like tight kimonos so they can't walk, you know, stuff like that where it's like these limitations are like signs of class and like all these kind of things. And I think that whole thing is kind of like slowly changing and that would be probably good for people how much of our uh, anthropotechnics and the way that we approach our bodies is also about uh, spectacle, about image. I would say an overwhelming majority of like these kind of interests come back to looking good, having more sex, like being projecting wealth and value about yourself. It's also normal, that comes down to an evolutionary thing, right? Where like proc procreation and survival are like the key things that we're going for. So like if the elements now are like this kind of super vanity, but I, I think a lot of it is about vanity. It's kind of complicated though, because people would talk a lot about performance in terms of like more classic sports performance, that they would pursue that, like functional training, not bodybuilding. I wonder if this is a nice way to try to think about um, processes beyond the subjective individual, that when we start thinking about somatic entrainment or these sort of habitus, habituses uh, of the human body and the different uh, techniques we have, um, to what degree do you think that this plays into evolutionary processes? On the one hand, I think there's like a long history of like fundamental ideas that people agree on about how the body can work. I mean, if you look at like martial arts and you look at like these kind of practices, these somatic things, and you look at like yoga and stuff like that, there are definitely like breathing and postural and like also mental strategies that are consistent across humans, but also like people are really flexible. And you know, people can live off of foods now that didn't exist physically, did not exist like ever until like a hundred years ago. And, and I mean, in terms of evolution and movement and stuff, I, it could be that we are in, I mean, that we go down a really weird path and that our bodies are transformed in a really strange way. And that like things that we think now, like this posture, like who knows, maybe we start to evolve like a weirder neck muscles that like help people like 
but probably it's more likely that screens anyways disappear and like go into some other bio state. I mean, I'm kind of into like the far sci-fi stuff. I think we'll either go extinct or mesh with computers and like I don't think that we'll be looking at screens for very long. Like I think that's really going to be like a short blip in kind of like the, yeah, the technology evolution of how we interact with stuff and whatever. Well, that's interesting even more so, too. So even if it doesn't become the direct like ergonomic consequences, um, it, if you did see this sort of uh, sci-fi future evolution, if we did kind of um, get rid of the screen, as you just said, um, what do you think the consequences are when you think about the body and the human body and this sort of entrainment in relationship to like technology or even like uh, virtuality in that sense, how it, becoming maybe less body? or more body, or how that affects this kind of long durée? I mean, we have like a, I don't know exactly how long the history of it is, but I mean the duality of mind and body, which is a pretty Christian thing, I guess, or maybe comes maybe from the Romans too, who are like kind of the ones who were getting away from like physical training as like a noble thing, and they were kind of putting it into like a workman like class, or they were even kind of grossed out by athletes apparently. They're like, ooh, it's a little bit too much. Like, so then at some point this gap starts to come, and like the Christians are like really grossed out by the body. They can't wait to get to heaven and just be like all up in the head. And I, there's a way also there we're talking about technology and kind of like leaving the body behind and like flying into this like cyberspace where there is no body. I, for me that sounds kind of gross. I guess I'm not into it. Because I really like being embodied and I like having this like physical senses and I like using my body and I also think that my brain is probably a direct, I mean the connection between my body and my mind is obviously super um, strong. So the idea to get rid of one or the other, I mean, getting rid of the mind, nobody really proposes that that much. But there is definitely something also in sports where there's a mindlessness to it, which is also really seductive. So I'm kind of more on the mindless side a lot of times I feel like actually, whether it's like dancing or climbing or like lifting a heavy weight where I'm so focused on what I'm doing that I'm not thinking like in the normal sense of language or like human interaction it's just like some kind of transcendent like effort or like uh, flow state which is really addictive actually 